welcome to today's uh, episode. I'm absolutely delighted to have here with us uh, Paromita Vora, a celebrated award-winning filmmaker and the founder of an amazing website called The Agents of Ishq, which is very much a Desi take on love, uh, sex and relationships. So it's wonderful that she's here to talk to us today as we are speaking about you know, the X in our lives and also the sex in our lives. So with that, I would like to really extend a warm welcome to you, Paromita. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me here. So, you know, as, as an opening question for you uh, that I have really is with the amazing work that you've been doing with Agents of Ishq and gaining insights over, you know, how people really uh, relate to relationships in their life. How do they navigate this whole uh, you know, love, sex, intimacy, which we seem to be moving through at all given times. Uh, so what would you like to share with us about that? Because one of the things I have seen is nowadays children, even young people have an ex in their life pretty much by the time they're done with school. And that is not something our generation really, uh, you know, saw. So how do you see that as impacting their maybe their personal choices or their outlook on life? Uh, hmm. So we would love to really hear from you about that. So I think, I mean, uh, before really thinking about the exes issue, I think that one thing that uh, both with Agents of Ishq and even before, because I have always been very interested in the space of intimacy as a place of politics, but also change, right? Like I feel that people, uh, not everybody always participates in a political movement, but there are ways in which political ideas are being tried out by people in their lives. And uh, as they live differently, also the world changes as much as it changes through movements and laws and all of those things. Uh, and of course, the space of intimacy is the space where gender really plays out in a very big way. So that has always interested me. And I think that one thing that we know, whether it's in our generation, generations previous or generations now, that there's often a kind of commonly discussed idea about relationships out there. Who is coming up with that idea and those sets of frameworks? It's hard to say. And then most of us are actually gauging our own life in relationship to those dominant ideas, right? Like what a good relationship is supposed to be. And that idea changes from time to time. So where in our parents' time, it may be that a good marriage is one in which your uh, social identity, you know, your caste, class, etc., match, and the woman marries up, uh, mm -hmm. who's going to do well in life, and that makes her settled, and she has children, and she has good relationship with her in-laws, and that means you've had a really good relationship. And, and they stay married forever, like forever. 50th yeah. anniversary, yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> longevity, longevity is even yeah. a, a, today, no matter what changes, mm. people see longevity as a sign of right. a successful relationship. Success. Yeah. Um, but when it changes, like say, I would say in my generation, our generation, it did change. Mm -hmm. But the idea that you will choose somebody for yourself uh, became quite popular among certain kinds of people. So, you know, this idea of love marriage or arranged marriage became common at a certain point. Unki love marriage, we do. People used to say that in a certain way, right? And often and presented as a, as a, as a, as a, dichotomy right you can either have a love marriage or an arranged marriage and then I've heard of this love come arranged marriage where yes. <laughs> somebody's presented to you for arranged marriage but you happen to fall in love so what you're saying is right people keep navigating through the political frameworks that are presented to them or even the other way around you fell in love and then you got your parents to agree <laughs> right. love marriage of I mean especially in my parents generation I've heard of many stories of elopement hmm. You know, so-and-so eloped and then they came to our yeah. house. So there is right. a sense of upheaval when you're making choice of your own. But I think by the time we come to our generation, it's becoming in urban spaces a little bit more accepted. But then, mm -hmm. of course, nobody questions that in a love marriage, you might be choosing also quite a suitable boy or girl or person, of right? Of and course. so many things are not really being queried when we're young. We're not hearing about queerness, for example, right? We yeah. didn't. I mean, in the 80s or 90s, it was very little spoken about. So the assumption that everybody's heterosexual, for instance. So yeah. I would say that people gauge their own love lives uh, with this idea that it was okay. Maybe you had a couple of boyfriends or, you know, whatever. But eventually you're going to get married. Like, oh. you've got to be chosen by somebody. 
And right. if we look at the rom-coms, they're also very, very absorbed with that idea of who's going to choose you. So marriage still continues to be, or at least a kind of togetherness and a coupledom continue to be the mark of it. And then, of course, being modern mm -hmm. also part of it. So the idea of, I mean, I remember in my youth, a lot of conversation about, you know, do men respect women or not? So the idea okay. that women are now beginning to sexually experiment, like there is some amount of sex outside marriage is be slowly becoming a spoken of norm. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sure sex outside marriage forever, but that it was becoming yeah. accepted. And uh, at the same time, there was a lot of unease about it. How would men mm -hmm. behave with men whom they had had sex with, but were not married to? So these were the kind of questions that started right. arise. And I think you see in the 90s, a lot of people talking about single women. Mm -hmm. And I, a single woman as somebody who has a different life also starts to emerge in cities at least. And seen as a threat, right? It's a danger because she's unpredictable, right? The single yes. woman. Yeah, you never know. A little bit aspirational for women. Right, yeah, right. of course. They will, uh, I mean, I, I would say my generation, we are the first generation in the city of women who began living on their own. Like there were very right. few when I started to do it. I was right. 23 when I began to live on my own and there were hardly any women. But today you see it's a very yeah. common thing that happens. So I think today, to come to jump forward, I think that there is a sense that, you know, we're not living anymore in the idea of traditional heterosexual coupledom. There mm -hmm. is a notion outside that uh, relationships, genders are fluid, relationships are fluid, there's polyamory, there's a lot of curiosity about these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a recurring question that we hear at Agents of Fish, whether online or in workshops, and that means we are saying people from rural semi-urban backgrounds, yeah. people in the city, metropolitan back, uh, spaces are often asking this question, ma'am, ek se zada insaan se pyar ho sakta hai kya? Is it right mm -hmm. or is it wrong to love more than one person at a time? There's a lot of uh, questions about, you know, like having different kinds of acronyms for different kinds of relationships. So friends yeah. with benefits or the idea that there can be sex without attachment is much right. more accepted the idea of a hookup the one night stand dating apps so yeah. i mean we are living in an era with the first generation of digital natives for one thing and second that it is genuinely a big shift relation upheaval quite kind of an upheaval actually yeah, it is uh, and i mean we have to see it in a larger context also not just mm -hmm. that digitality has allowed things to happen mm -hmm. But people are also migrating in a big way. You know, people are leaving their homes and their right. cities and towns to, for other places, for work, for studies, in a much bigger way than before. So they also don't have the same networks. Uh, right. if, I mean, not like people were infinitely meeting people in networks. But right, right. In, the in the late 90s, when the internet came, for people who use the internet to be experimental with their love lives, mm -hmm. There was a kind of uh, embarrassment, a hiding involved. Like people right. who met online often would lie about how they had met. True, true. And people thought that those who went online to meet people are desperate because they are not cool enough to meet people on their own, right? right. But okay, there's just, I mean, I don't think anybody has met anybody offline anymore. It's true, it's true. <laughs> but what you're saying kind of reminds me, I was just, as you were saying, it reminds me of a parallel to tuition classes, you know? Hmm. Initially, it was like, oh my God, they're desperate. Like, why would you join a tuition class? And now it's like, now you have tuition classes which have actually become legitimized as as the college, you know. Yes, so exactly. it's it's very interesting to see how radically things shift in a in a space of a generation. And in fact, you know, uh, there are many stories where people say, Wo mujhe coaching mein mili thi. So the idea of also finding romance <laughs> in the coaching class. Right. <laughs> so right. That today, I mean, this in a generation which has seen so much migration, so much cultural shift in the conversation around sexuality, mm -hmm. and of course the mobile phone and the internet and being connected to numerous people at the same time. Right. This is the objective reality that I think uh, people are living in now. Mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, like anything, it has its uh, tough sides and exciting sides. Like right. I, I, nobody, can, uh, nobody can question that there is something exciting about being able to have so much experimentation in mm -hmm. your intimate life, to be able to be so frolicsome is a dream. I mean, that you can go out, you can date people. Put clothes and fancy free. <laughs> having fun, right? Like when the yeah. weight of shame and secrecy mm. is taken off of you, it ideally right. should be fun. Right. But, I mean, we aren't hearing that many stories of it's fun, right? And mm -hmm. that's because 
uh, all of that is accompanied by so many other realities. For instance, of course, you know the statistics that large number of people still marry within their past and many of people course. actually plan to marry somebody that family chooses. So yeah. in India, the idea of marriage still remains mm -hmm. overwhelming. I would say there's a big gender difference in attitude, right? Like it okay. has always been that women embrace feminism, queer people embrace difference. Right. And in a sense, we have nothing to lose. So we right. um, into a new life, right? We take those risks, we embark on those intimate mm -hmm. adventures. But the, I mean, many, especially heterosexual men, have not always caught up with that. Right. They continue. In fact, they feel quite threatened, right? So you see the toxic masculinity really coming up when uh, faced with things which are not, not the, which are shifting the status quo in in a way. So yeah. yes, that's for sure. And I think, like, uh, though I don't much use the term toxic masculinity because I think it's right. become so like a, a kind of default usage that now it almost feels as if all masculinity is by default toxic. Right. So I, it doesn't help any of us. But right. I do agree that I think that when faced with so much change, mm -hmm. when faced with the demand for change, because mm -hmm. it really means that you have to dissolve some of your centrality. See, right. I mean, when you use the word privilege, people always look at it a little bit. They say, mm -hmm. I have difficulties, which they right, do. Right, right, of course. The thing is, heterosexual men are used to being central. Of course. Across the board, relative to their own families or context, men are mm -hmm. central. And everything is supposed right. to be about helping them to make their path in life. And we are also right. men and women. So yeah. when that centrality is gone, then how do you learn how to matter? Right. right. I mean, you need an uh, you need an entire kind of res resources of, right. um, of collegiality, right. of being equal. Actually, yeah. these are all like charm it's is a question of equality, right? Like absolutely. So, so I mean, a celebrity doesn't. Have, why do we love Shah Rukh Khan? Because though he's a celebrity, he works very hard to charm us at every yeah. single moment, absolutely. and that gives us the illusion of being on an equal plane with him. That's the and dream. that you matter. And that you matter. So, so, you so segueing from that, actually, beautifully, what you said. Uh, so, you know, the work that I'm doing with conscious uncoupling, a uh, lot of it focusing on uh, women who are going through divorce. Mm -hmm. And as you said, quite rightly, you know, the uh, there is a social upheaval that we are living in the midst of. But most people are still seeing marriage as the sacred, uh, you know, seven, seven lives, uh, you know, kind of a permanency. And divorce is still being shamed and stigmatized. Uh, so women who are actually in abusive or violent or deeply unhappy marriages, finding it very difficult to move on. So how do you do you see any of these stories coming through? Because I know that the younger generation actually openly says we are commitment phobic. Mm. So they don't want to be tied down. And on the other hand, I, you know, I'm talking to so many women who are stuck in like a permanent commitment, which they are unable to get out of, mm -hmm. uh, even though sometimes their life may be in danger. So how do you see, um, you know, this kind of dichotomy playing out in the people you uh, interact with? I mean, I think that for young people, I would say there is a shift, at least in theory, that mm -hmm. most people don't want to remain in a situation that is really ugly or difficult for them. That said, I think people do stay in abusive contexts, right? Like we do get some some number of narratives where people talk about having had an abusive ex or having yeah. been in toxic relationships, so on and so forth. But I do think that the fact that we are getting those narratives means people also move away from them. Right. It takes them some time as it might any human being. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. like it's it, it's important for us to tease apart why people do that, right? Like on the one hand, for a certain kind of person, not necessarily only a generation, because as we know in India, all things are true at all times. And change happens in different ways for different people. Right? But I think that uh, on the one hand, Many people grow up being told that marriage is the goal. Yeah. If not marriage, coupledom is the goal. Mm -hmm. So it's increasingly difficult to achieve in this present context. One, because of all the social changes that have happened. Yeah. Um, two, because women are more ambitious. They're working. There's, they want somebody that will be their their partner. Equal partner. Yeah. yeah. Then it's harder to find. So yeah. the thing is that if you found somebody, whether love or arranged, so to speak, the the, the the it's the feeling that you won't be able to find someone else is very strong. Mm. And we don't have much conversation in, in our culture, or perhaps in any culture, 
about what's the purpose of life mm-hmm. like how do you want to live who do you want to be yeah. this is your quest sure. what are you looking for right life is a series of goal posts yeah. and so there is a lot of internal panic even if you are earning well even if you're yeah. you have some support like you know how many of us have had friends actually mm. incredibly successful in their work mm. and often in abusive marriages like i yeah. had uh, there was someone i knew who was in a who was married to an awful man and the first time that i met him i just thought oh my god mm. I mean, there was a terrible and ugly fight in front of me, and I was mm. horrified. And this continued for years, fifteen oh. mm. years or something. And some, uh, on that person's fortieth birthday, uh, we're about the same age. Uh, she called me and she said, "You know, I'm getting divorced." And I said, "Thank God! Thank God! <laughs> yes, thank God! Absolutely!" So, I mean, you know, I I just it used to be so tough for me to watch, true, but true, true. I didn't. feel that there was an opening for me to say something and but i asked the work yeah sorry yeah carry on so i asked her that suppose yeah. i told you like back then in our 20s that look i think you're in an abusive marriage what would you have said mm. and she said i would have thought you're jealous of me because you're not married right right i mean it's a very telling tale in a way true 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 so what i was going to ask you actually was that you know the, the amazing work that you're doing through agents of ishq with love intimacy relationships uh, i was going to ask you exactly something similar is that for our generation uh, i think the whole concept of red flags mm-hmm. of recognizing toxicity abuse of healthy modeling of relationships amongst you know people around us i think all that was so absent that which is why now we are seeing increasingly a wave of what we are calling a gray divorce mm-hmm. uh, you know women or couples in their 50s Uh, mm-hmm. children have grown up moved on to university and now realizing as you said exactly what is the purpose of life you know mm-hmm. what am i going to do with this literally probably half my life is still left because um, you know you're living in the middle classes in the urban areas you're likely to live to be 80 90 uh, you know quite functional and healthy uh, however we are doing this in the midst of a increasingly traditional or you know a more conservative kind of a mindset that we are seeing uh, sweeping the landscape and uh, it's it's a real struggle yeah. uh, to maintain that kind of a liberal i remember when i wrote the book um, uh, about road map to managing divorce my publisher actually said that you know speed up your manuscript because there's no other book on divorce in india yours is going to be the first book and i remember thinking seriously in 2023 like that there's not even a single book uh, and it, it's a little bit alarming uh, to imagine the level of silence that women have suffered in for all these years Mm. um so i i don't know how do do you talk about red flags and as you said if people know enough in advance are they confident enough and capable of, enough of negotiating their way out of such relationships so i think you know on the red flag thing again that's not so much the age of ishq way right because for us yeah. it's much more like you should be able to identify green flags okay. rather than always look for red flags because if mm-hmm. you think about it you know there was this book in the 90s called the rules i don't know if you remember okay mm-hmm. i don't know it was like how to get a ring on your finger in x number of days or whatever right now <laughs> when i read the book i started crying because i said this is so horrible and is this gosh <laughs> so there were many rules in that like for example okay. and now when i read those rules by the way i was mm-hmm. want to say i have my ambivalence towards it so mm-hmm. at that time i was like this is bullshit so it was like if he asks you out on a date mm-hmm. after wednesday for a saturday Mm-hmm. say even if you're free okay? okay because it shows that he doesn't respect you right so there were a series of things given that if you right, right. Married, play hard to get and yeah 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 those kind of things of course these are the very things that we are telling people are red flags and they're not actually wrong things because what they are pointing to is these are signs that people treat you casually and do right. you want to be treated right. casually right. or do you want to be treated with some amount of regard and respect yeah, right? yeah. at the same time what's the degree of intimacy and casualness that actually exists between people like we also crave that right like we are saying right. what happened to the days when we could just pick up the phone and say hey are you free do you want to mm. go out this evening mm. so well, where is the spontaneity so i feel so, like most of the time we are being given so many rules mhm and that creates a fearful fearfulness in us what we have mm-hmm. to protect ourselves from right because if you start to create a language and that's what agents of ish tries to do to identify what it is you want mhm and yep. say I'm looking for that thing so right. that that thing is not aapko hasil nahi ho rahi if you're not obtaining mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. maybe that thing is not for you that's mm-hmm. one i think right. the 
one thing that we really try to encourage the conversation is that you know a little bit of life is learned only in the living you actually so, can't be prepared for every single thing the theorize it and have your checklist ready and you know yeah, yeah you have to actually go out there and and figure yeah. it out absolutely and, i mean right. that happens in friendships that yeah. happens in work situations yeah. that you know, something looks perfect on paper a friendship can last 10 years and then yeah. run aground because yeah. I mean the way I've learned to see it now is that you know some relationships reach the end of their intimacy. Yeah. This is as far as those two people whether yeah. friends, colleagues, lovers, partners True. can True. you know that they're not able to do the work needed True. to be alongside each other. Yeah, but but I think the fact that we put so much emphasis on the one, you know, yeah like so a friendship if it falls apart although sometimes it can be far more traumatic it mm. is not seen as seriously as if an so called intimate relationship falls apart so which is why having an ex you know I, and i found this very interesting i was talking to a group of young people and they were generally just having informal conversation and saying oh i'm not in a relationship and i thought that's so telling because we all are in so many relationships but when you say i'm not in a relationship it's understood to mean that i don't have a significant other or i don't have a partner Yeah. that is the kind of the high value we place on only that one relationship yeah. which I mean, probably also makes it difficult right because then that one person has to be your everything soulmate yeah. and emotionally available and sexually amazing and you know intellectual and all yeah. all the green flags as well so and, and if and not only that but that person has to be the central relationship of your life right like absolutely and and they may well be i mean i think that one can't deny that romantic relationships have a different register like yeah. they have different valence in our lives right because Absolutely. there are intimacies there that are not present in other relationships but that yeah. said you know the idea that like often i find people either say, like people speak in binaries a lot no? so mm-hmm. it will be like oh i don't want any relationships like romantic relations right i have my friends or um, they are my chosen family right it's not a binary actually what we are saying is that life itself is non binary that mm-hmm. you do have sometimes a primary deep romantic relationship right. that keep all your attention and energies but alongside it you have many others and right. the thing is that you know it's very hard to actually build that life if there's no conversation about that life right. if every story you're ever told in every discussion like i'm saying even the green flag red flag discussion mm-hmm. is essentially what what mm-hmm. all the energies of public conversation on how to make couple to work everything we do is like okay how can right, we make right, right? true and true true we're saying what could be the way to make an emotional life work for you right for you that may involve coupledom for you it may not involve coupledom and in a world that is made for coupledom and families true i think it's false to promote the idea that oh being single is so amazing i mean yeah. i'm and i have chosen that mm. and i've shaped my life in certain ways to make it in india i think you can make it sustainable to be single because we have emotional right. relationships family like relationships with others of course but the thing is that there are difficulties attached to it but to be able to communicate that no life is perfect right and our emotional life has to be rich and it has to be something that sustains us i mean where are the stories about it where are they right. Right. and the other thing is that of course there's a lot of young people we engage with but youth knows only so much and no more Mm. but the generational divide is too extreme now because of the digital break that right, happened right right so at least i feel on agents fish we work hard nowadays to also bring generational stories in right to actually have conversations with older people to learn right. how they've lived their life because actually we had the benefit of that if i had mm. not known some older people who were single or if my mother's family which is quite uncommon my grandparents were separated in fact so right. if i hadn't had those examples i won't say they are role models they are right. real examples Just lived realities yeah absolutely some ke log hote hain har kisam ke rishte right right, right. i would have also entertained these notions of right. living the way i live right like my fantasy was always that i'll have a place of my own and it'll mm-hmm. have a window this was my fantasy right you know I mean that fantasy has come true. Right. It's like fantasy that are many other realities like EMIs and of course, of course, of that. course. So I, But I get I get what you're saying because again, otherwise it seems as though singledom and coupledom, like even glorifying singledom, mm. is still setting it up as a as a binary. But yeah. saying that there's a range of relationships possible, and you may go through different relationships in the entire spectrum of your life. 
Um, it feels like, you know, uh, what you're saying is exactly, you know, one of the things I come up with when I'm uh, working with clients on conscious uncoupling mm. is how little we know of our own emotional landscape yes, exactly. and how much the conditioning of what is told to us as normal mm. uh, is modeled by just a few people around us, mm. which now with the digital explosion, of course, people are seeing other kind of lived realities. Mm. But otherwise, we only saw the few people around us, all of whom were probably, uh, you know, as emotionally dysfunctional as everybody else. So we never really knew mm. what healthy would look like. Uh, yeah. So I think that has done, you know, quite a bit of damage to some of us in 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 that gener in our generation. But I think the younger people, I don't know, are we really offering any better role models to uh, younger people? I mean, I think both the things happen, right? Like on the one hand, there are more iterations of other lives that are available mm -hmm. for people to see. Right. And uh, people... I mean, I feel that unfortunately, social media is as bad as whatever other, you know, right. cultural stereotyping that used to exist because social right. media very swiftly makes everything, you know, for example, you might read a very beautiful poem online one day mm -hmm. and by day seven, you're like, I never want to read that fucking poem right. because everybody's okay. sharing it. Now. So the, the speed with which something mm. becomes homogenized becomes actually normal. Mm -hmm. Right. Like Andy Warhol said, everyone's famous for 15 minutes. I think we've yeah. reduced that even to less than 15 minutes at this point. Yeah. And you're only, you're only really able to be famous for a narrow band of things. Because if you communicate a very complex message on social media, that's harder. So right. there is a tendency on social media, I feel, for certain kinds of absolutes to right. take right. You know, like There are certain words that start getting used to describe women, mm -hmm. which are like badass or fear. Mm -hmm. So yeah. these are all those <laughs> Boss babe. <laughs> Boss babe. Yeah, that kind of I think these are also kind of flattening ideas. Rather, mm -hmm. the effort is always, and I don't think it's only now, but it has always been. And it's how to present three dimensional lives and three dimensional people. Yeah. So people know that, yes, life is complex and has many facets, right. and some good right. and some bad. Right. And I feel with young yeah. people, what I see is see, they have more awareness. Mm -hmm of uh, uh, these kinds of things and they are working through it as i said earlier faster than other people because they don't think of one relationship as the last relationship mm. they are not as they don't it's not as tough for them to leave one as it might have been at another time right on right. the other hand it's also not as easy for them to enter one right. like you know, one of the questions i get most frequently asked when i go somewhere is ma'am what do you think about situationships mm -hmm. And the last time that somebody asked me this, I said, well, you know, I actually, I'm not like a fan of situationships on their mm -hmm. own. I think it's a right. thing that's come to be. But for me, the most important question is not what's the shape of the relationship, but what's the way you engage in the relationship. Right. If a situationship is being carried out in a way that there's no conversation between people, it disallows any intimacy, right, right, right. it disallows warmth, mm -hmm. then what's so evolved about it? True, right? true, true.